Hello everyone and welcome to week six of uh, New Introduction to New Testament. Uh, this is my favorite part of the course because I love Paul. I uh, did my dissertation on 1 Corinthians so uh, and throughout my career in the uh, PhD courses that I took I always always did something on Paul. It didn't matter what um, the actual topic of the course was and uh, nobody stopped me so I just kept studying Paul because I knew that I was going to be building up to uh, my dissertation and also further books and articles on Paul and uh, the Gospels didn't interest me that much because they I for one thing I did a whole lot of work in the Gospels before I got into the PhD program but um, the Gospels have a lot of problems that we don't have to deal with whenever we study Paul. Not that Paul doesn't have as many problems or challenges, but um, I just didn't like the form criticism and historical criticism of the Gospels. I didn't think I could do much with it. But with Paul, we have a remarkable character that we can we can continually study and find new things about him. And uh, he is a mystery because he combines a Greek education with a hearty uh, Jewish tradition and he does it so well that um, it makes him hard to interpret like if Paul was just one thing he would be a lot easier to pin down but because Paul is many things at once uh, it's difficult to tell what is um, being expressed you know like you used to say or I used to hear that, uh, you know, sometimes Jesus speaks as human and sometimes Jesus speaks as divine. Well, sometimes Paul speaks as a Pharisee, sometimes he speaks as a persecutor, former persecutor of the church, sometimes he speaks as a Roman citizen, and sometimes he speaks with all of those combined. So it makes it very challenging to interpret things, and it also means that a lot of his writings have several different meanings, several different possibilities that are equally valuable. So this is one of the few places where I'm not following Metzger. These are my own notes. And uh, I did my dissertation on Paul, of course, as I said. So I love Paul, and you should too. Uh, a lot of people have a, a very um, tenuous relationship with Paul, or they hate his guts. Uh, my students at at Brighton Divinity School hated Paul because they grew up in a different church tradition. There were disciples of Christ and they had a confession that is no creed but Jesus. No creed but Jesus. That means they only study the words of Jesus Christ. And uh, Baptists grew up with something slightly different no creed but the Bible. So Baptists know the entire Bible. And Baptists um, study the entire Bible in the Sunday school and in, and the um, the sermons treat the entire Bible. Whereas if, you, if your creed is no creed but Jesus, uh, then stuff gets thrown by the wayside. And uh, the only things that these uh, seminarians had heard about Paul was negative. You know, Paul uh, does Paul is a misogynist. He hates women. You know, Paul supports slavery. Um, Paul is very forceful whenever, you know, he exerts more authority than he should, and so on and so forth. You know, we can, we can hate Paul and have very good reasons for doing so, but we have to recognize that there's more to Paul than those negative things. You know, Paul, Paul's mission in life after he converted to Christianity, and I use that term lightly, converted, um, you know, he has this conversion experience where he experiences the resurrected Jesus, and his passion after that is combining the promises of the Jews, you know, the, the promise of Abraham, promise of the Messiah, with uh, Gentiles. And he wants to bring Gentiles and Jews together under one theology and one worship structure. And uh, that didn't work. You know, it, it worked 
a little bit. You know, he established churches, very successful in the sense that he established many churches. But his vision was so much greater than what he accomplished. And, uh, it, and the church as a whole split from Judaism even while he was trying to unite, the, unite these people. And it was successful only with the Gentiles, you know, on a, on a major scale. His theology only really worked with Gentiles and the Jews who had, you know, the tradition of the Torah and the synagogue worship and all that, you know, they simply uh, ignored the Christian movement altogether, and they kind of still do. So, who is Paul? He is from Tarsus, uh, which is a city uh, in the east, in the east of uh, the Roman Empire. It's a port city, and it's a wealthy city. And because of this, uh, it kind of sheds light on who Paul is, because he it's feasible that his father was a Roman citizen, and he was a success he was a successful businessman, probably a tanner or a uh, tradesman. He bought his citizenship, and then Paul was a Roman citizen. I mean, you can kind of hear it, hear the argument, it's kind of weak. Um, but a lot of people think that uh, Paul was a citizen, at least of Tarsus, and probably of Rome. They think that because of how Paul speaks of himself in Acts. You know, Paul gets uh, arrested and beaten at, at one point, and he protests and says, you cannot treat a Roman citizen this way, which was true. But they could have done that to the foreigner without any problem or non-citizen. And it also sheds some light, you know, this being from this wealthy city, uh, his education and his rhetoric, you know, the rhetoric that he uses in his letters, how he, speak, how he speaks, is, uh, it, it reflects classical training in speech and rhetoric. Uh, you know, what we know they were teaching in Roman schools or uh, Roman education, you know, learning from a tutor, you would learn the techniques that Paul uses. And one of those techniques is called the diatribe, the Stoic diatribe. And I know that that word, the, both words sound familiar to you, but the diatribe is simply a way of arguing. It's a style of argument. And uh, Galatians and Romans follow the diatribe pattern. And education was only available to the wealthy. Therefore, people think that Paul was wealthy, you know, from this wealthier city. However, he became poor whenever he accepted the gospel. And he traveled from city to city, and he worked for a living. So you can kind of see the complexity already uh, starting, to, starting to bloom. You know, he is showing signs that he's wealthy, and he's also so showing signs that he's very, very poor. Uh, and also, the uh, tent-making aspect of, of Paul's life uh, would allow him to travel even though he was poor. A tent maker only has like four tools in, in, in the ancient world and uh, they can be very mobile and uh, travel is very dangerous in ancient times so a lot of times poor people would travel with wealthy people who have bodyguards and they would even help protect the wealthy person so you don't need to be wealthy in order to do what Paul did. But, you probably have to be wealthy to speak like Paul spoke. Or write like Paul wrote. Okay, who is Paul? Some more. Uh, he is a Pharisee. We've already learned what uh, Pharisees are. Which basically means he is a committed Jew. You know, he, he is committed to following the law in a, in a very strict way. He says in Philippians that he was a Pharisee of Pharisees, and he exceeded everyone in his zeal for following the law, and uh, that's probably true. Uh, he persecuted the church early on, uh, and he repented. He had a very dramatic uh, conversion experience in Acts, but he never refers to that uh, experience like it's described by Luke. So 
at some point he had a conversion experience and he became a, a fabulous, fantastic uh, apostle. Um, he's a tent maker and that is what makes people think that he was poor because tent makers were not wealthy but uh, some um, sorry I got distracted there uh, some scholars have proven that as a tent maker he could have made enough money to travel uh, everywhere that Paul traveled according to the Bible and still be uh, basically living in poverty uh, and I think that I think that's pretty much what happened too while Paul was an apostle he worked for a living but before he became an apostle he could have been wealthy okay he never met Jesus uh, this is something remarkable about Paul it is that he never he wasn't one of the uh, people who followed Jesus around whenever Jesus was active in his ministry. He followed Jesus later, and he says that he received his gospel directly from Jesus. You know, the teachings that Paul taught come from Jesus, like an um, existential experience or prophetic experience with Jesus. And he says in Galatians that he went to Jerusalem to meet uh, Peter and James and John and learn a little bit from them, but they didn't really give him the gospel. He just uh, met with them and they certified that what he was preaching was accurate. But it's remarkable that so many churches in such a wide geographical area accepted Paul's authority whenever Paul traveled into a city and preached. Uh, he wasn't very a very good preacher. Uh, you know, we we see that in uh, 1 Corinthians. He says, you know, the people complained about him whenever he came. They said he doesn't speak very well, but, when, but his letters are good. So his physical presence, his physical uh, speaking presence, wasn't all that great. But he had uh, the gospel, preached the gospel, and, some, and a lot of people really believed him, and they accepted his letters basically a scripture, almost at, right after they received it. You know, they received it as, as holy words. You know, we know that only uh, 50 years after Paul's death, there are Christians writing and praising the works of the beloved, the beloved Apostle Paul. Um, he founded many churches. He traveled all over the Mediterranean uh, preaching his gospel. Uh, he is a missionary apostle, uh, and apostle is a term of authority. You know, the, 12, the 11 and then 12 apostles, they were regarded as leaders of the church. And Paul very quickly uh, was elevated to that level of authority. He wrote most of the New Testament, uh, and that's, that's unique. Uh, you know, Paul, what Paul did was nowhere else done in the Roman Empire. Uh, you know, he founded uh, communities and then he maintained them with letters. And he was inter continually teaching and adding to what he had taught. Uh, through these letters, he was able to maintain uh, communities in various cities. And to my knowledge, that could have been done one other time but it's not like what Paul did, you know, with him going and founding it himself and then maintaining it with letters. He probably died in 67 CE, and the reason why we think probably is because we don't really know when Paul died. Um, I think he died about 67, but I don't really care about that stuff, you know, exactly, exactly when Paul died. Uh, I've seen so many different uh, accounts of his life and dividing up the time uh, between each letter, um, and I think that it's okay to just think, just know he died sometime in the 60s in, uh, in Rome. You know, that's church tradition. You know, Paul was beheaded after he appealed to Caesar from a uh, trial that went bad. Okay, the writings of Paul, 
you need to know some oh sorry you need to know some terminology here the first off is uh, disputed and undisputed now you probably heard this term uh, by pastors before and if you hadn't uh, the problem is or the issue we have Paul uh, writing most of the New Testament and he was such a popular character uh, back in the time the New Testament was being written that some people wrote in his name it is a Christian pseudepigrapha and we've touched on it a little bit before uh, Paul was such a, a uh, dominant figure that people thought some people thought you know the writings that the right the writers of first second Timothy and Titus thought that if they write in Paul's name they will be received and guess what they were and they still are so uh, nobody believes now that Paul wrote those epistles and when I say nobody I mean the uh, consensus scholarly consensus is overwhelming that Paul didn't write it and that is uh, not even disputed now the disputed letters that means the authorship is disputed that are attributed to Paul are Ephesians and Colossians and the reason why they're disputed is because they do, they do not share the same vocabulary uh, you know the words are different in the way that, that they use words um, the rhetoric is different you know the structure of the argument and the uh, theology is different but most importantly the church structure is what determines if a letter is Pauline or not Pauline so in other words there are um, there's a body of literature that we definitely know is written by Paul and whenever scholars study it they find a common vocabulary a common rhetoric a common theology and a common church structure and those letters are uh, for example first Thessalonians Galatians Romans okay I've named them all um, you know, whenever scholars look at, at some of these letters uh, they see they can build a theology of Paul or a characteristic of Paul that is consistent but whenever they compare that body of evidence to other letters attributed to Paul like the pastorals 1st 2nd Timothy and Titus it, there's no way that they can match you know we know that it's impossible that the same person who wrote Galatians wrote 1st Timothy okay the epistles of Paul um, they contain ancient rhetoric we already talked about that uh, rhetoric is the way of convincing people there are a lot of different types of rhetoric uh, you know the ancient Greeks and Romans were very concerned with how to construct a speech because that's how uh, you got away with uh, being a lawyer you know you got people convicted or you got people not convicted based on your argument not based on the evidence so if you had someone who was you know the best person who could argue was the one who would get uh, wealthy by being a good orator or a lawyer and also orators would motivate troops to fight they could motiv motivate troops not to fight so you know and you can tell in the ancient world that's a very important role and in the epistles of Paul we can see or scholars can identify ancient speech structure which is ancient rhetoric and they can even name it you know the stoic diatribe for example and this even the, the cynic diatribe and uh, I can't remember the name of it judicial speech you know the speech of the courtroom you know we can we can identify different types of speeches in the epistles of Paul so the epistle is sort of a speech but it's sort of not because it follows ancient epistolary theory also there are a few and by a few I mean a really a few maybe four 
uh, ancient epistolary theorists, and they tell us the different types of letters there are in the ancient world, and how to write them, and how to not, how to interpret them. So we we know that uh, Paul's letters are occasional. You know, we know that they they are actual letters. They're not uh, they're not uh, moral letters like a philosopher would write letters that where the philosopher teaches his philosophy or her philosophy and they're called moral letters. Seneca wrote a lot of moral letters and some Neopythagoreans of Paul's day wrote letters that weren't really letters. You know, it's like uh, Plato writing a letter to uh, Cicero and Plato's been dead for 400 years and uh, he's teaching his his philosophy, he's not really writing a letter. But Paul, on the other hand, when we compare the letters of Paul to the ancient epistolary theorists, that is, the people who wrote about letters in the ancient world, and also we have a lot of papyri letters from Egypt, you know, actual letters from the ancient world, we know that Paul is writing a letter. We also know that Paul is sort of writing a speech. And uh, the types of speech would be, uh, they are types of persuasion, already covered that, and traditional parts of the speech. Um, and then there are, so we know that it's, it's a speech, it's rhetoric, and it's also a letter. It's an epistle. So there's a little bit of scholarly chaos called, and it's called letter partition theories. Uh, that means that uh, somebody thinks, his name is Bauer, he thinks that 1st and 2nd Corinthians combined are actually 13 letters, and they're all out of order. And the way that he figures out that uh, there's 13 letters is he compares, the, he compares pieces of 1st Corinthians and 2nd Corinthians to ancient speeches and also to ancient letters. And how that fits together um, is very difficult to tell, that he thinks that he has figured out a way to definitely identify different pieces of the letter that are concise arguments, or even parts of arguments, and they're a certain type of letter also. So it's very confusing. If you ever have to do a PhD paper, uh, don't do it on 2 Corinthians, because it is a mess and it'll take you forever and you won't learn anything. <laughs> um, the Trinity, the Holy Trinity, is uh, something that is a term that I use and, and uh, nobody else, so if you mention the Holy Trinity uh, in reference to what I'm about to say, um, nobody will know what you're talking about, but this is how I remember it. The Holy Trinity tells us what is Pauline. You know, it defines Paul's vocabulary, style, and theology. And the Holy Trinity is Galatians, 1 Corinthians, and Romans. And uh, they share such a close uh, vocabulary and style, theology, and church structure that we know these letters are undisputed. You know, everybody knows that Paul wrote Galatians, 1 Corinthians, and Romans. And we can add, as a uh, kind of second Holy Spirit, I guess, uh, add First Thessalonians. But what, what I have done in my research is, you know, these three letters prove who Paul is, and it, it's how we test and know that other letters are written by Paul. So um, hopefully that will be useful to you. But these three letters are undisputed. Okay, genuine writings or undisputed writings. These are writings that most scholars think Paul wrote. 1 Thessalonians is the first one. It's written between 50 and 51 CE. Now, the central theology of 1 Thessalonians is faith, hope, and love, and a central theme is persecution. And it's very significant who is doing the persecuting in 1 Thessalonians, that is, the Jews. You know, Paul complains especially 
in uh, 2 Thessalonians that God is going to punish uh, the Jews who are who are persecuting you. So uh, that's something that's very significant. It means that most, if not all, of the Thessalonian Christians were Gentiles. And uh, Paul had a really hard time recruiting Jews for some reason. And I think I know why. I'm uh, going to have to get to that a little bit later. Uh, 1 Corinthians is definitely Pauline. Uh, you have, it's written from Ephesus about four years later, and the themes in uh, 1 Corinthians are centered around, mostly around wealthy people, their legal problems. Uh, you also have the mother-in-law incident where a uh, son-in-law is living with a mother-in-law, and also a theme is uh, church as a body. 2 Corinthians, as I said a minute ago, is a god-awful mess. Uh, some people think that it was written as early as 40, and you'll notice that's about 14 years before 1 Corinthians was written, and uh, about 57 is the latest, and uh, that is a Gordian knot. Galatians is also a genuine writing, about 54 to 58 CE, and uh, a theme there is a, the unity between Jews and Gentiles around a dinner table. You know, as you know, Jews have very strict dietary laws, and uh, the Jews and Gentiles were struggling, but at least they were struggling, and they there's evidence that uh, the church is made up of a good population of Jews and Gentiles, and they are they're struggling together. Romans is undisputed. Um, it's written as part of the Holy Trinity, uh, written in about 57. This is Paul's magnum opus, his greatest work, uh, written in, in Corinth. And we can actually trace, you know, whenever we look at these letters, and especially in the order that we that we see them, we can we can actually trace. I'm getting excited. I'm sorry. I'm repeating myself, but we can actually trace the development of Paul's theology. You know, Paul does not teach the same thing in all of his letters. It's similar, but it's not the same, and it is best expressed in Romans, and I think also in Philippians. Uh, and Philemon is a letter from uh, Paul to a slave owner to uh, free his slave. So that's uh, been used uh, very positively throughout history for that uh, purpose, especially recently. Um, Philippians is my favorite letter uh, that Paul wrote, and that's centered around a hymn, a, a hymn to Jesus about who Jesus is. You know, it's a, it starts out with uh, Jesus being equal to God, on the same, the same uh, substance as God, he pours out his divinity, becomes a man, but is obedient to God, even to death on a cross. And because of that, Jesus is raised up and exalted above everyone and everything in the cosmos. And Paul patterns himself and that letter after that pattern. You know, the pattern of being equal with God. You know, Paul is a Pharisee of Pharisees. He's, he is... Um, above all others in terms of zeal for the law. He, he neglects that heritage whenever he converts. He becomes low, and Paul is following God, even to death, and Paul will be, at the end, like Jesus, Paul will be raised up. So that kind of pattern is uh, the pattern we find in Philippians, and I love it. I like that, the, you know, the idea of, you know, the death, and, you know, the death and the resurrection pattern is uh, pretty phenomenal. The disputed letters, that means that some scholars think that Paul wrote these epistles. Some scholars think that, I uh, forgot what I said first, some think it, it's divided on authorship. Some scholars think that Paul wrote it. Some, Paul, some Pauline scholars think that Paul did not write it. 
So that's uh, 2 Thessalonians, Ephesians, and Colossians. And I used Ephesians and Colossians as an example earlier because those are the letters that are, you know, most disputed. Uh, you know, because there's so much fun to study. You know, Colossians has almost all of Ephesians in it. And vice, you know, vice versa, they share almost everything. So you wonder why, uh, you know, either one or the other exists, because it's basically the same thing. So, uh, in, except for a little bit of occasional stuff, you know, a little bit of context or superfluous details. And there are the pastoral letters, which no one thinks is Pauline. It's, they're called Deuteropauline letters, after Paul. First, second Timothy and Titus. Now, I was a TA in a course one time where the professor, who was a nun, said, there's not a snowball's chance in hell that Paul wrote the pastorals. <laughs> and I thought, oh my God, I cannot believe that I heard that. Uh, but it's true. And first and second Thessalonians are uh, letters that we read uh, this week. Um, I, I did a lot of work on first and second Thessalonians for my dissertation. And this is what I think happened. We've already seen that Jews were persecuting Gentiles. Um, the church, in other words, is vulnerable. Back in the old days, you had a patron, if you were lucky, and patrons would provide a household for the church to meet in, they would provide meals, and those are themes of 1 Corinthians. You know, 1 Corinthians addresses problems related directly to uh, patrons and clients. Clients are the, 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 the people who have reciprocal relationships with their patrons. And what I think happened was whenever Paul went into Thessalonica, he was a young apostle, very excited about what he's doing, and he did something called frank speech. His initial preaching when he first got there was frank speech. And frank speech is corrective speech. And that's, imagine uh, someone criticizing you for something but in order to be constructive, you know, you have to be close to a person. You have to kind of know them in order to correct them. You know, tell them uh, things about, telling your friends things about them that no one else should tell them. So that kind of concept was alive in the ancient world. Um, friends could tell each other anything and they could be frank with each other. But if you're not friends, if you haven't built up the relationship, you can't use frank speech or it's defensive. So Paul goes, marches into Thessalonica and starts preaching in a very caustic way, especially about idol worship uh, and, and other things that are going on in Gentile life. So he loses Gentile support and no wealthy person wants to support Paul because he is he's alienating everyone else. You know, you can't be a patron of someone that offends your that offends your friends. So Paul has trouble finding patrons to support the church. And patrons are the ones who provide meals and money and protection. And the The uh, Thessalonians, the believers that Paul is writing to, they are defenseless and poor. You know, they don't have a connection with the higher-ups in society, or even one higher-up. And we don't see uh, the kind of thing that we see in 1 Corinthians, where people are, are having a meal in a house. You know, there's no meal mentioned in uh, 1 and 2 Thessalonians. And there's no instructions for the wealthy. You know, there's no kind of um, exhortation that could be directed toward someone wealthy. You know, it's all toward uh, lower class individuals. And there's no mention of a home. 
in uh, Thessalonica, and then in Paul's later letters, you know, in Romans, in Galatians, in Corinthians, there's, there are uh, meals, you know, the worship is centered around meals, which eventually became the Lord's Supper. So, I wanted to show you something. This is a house uh, in Roman times. This is the kind of house that uh, the Corinthians would be worshiping in. This is uh, the entrance and then the atrium and a shop right here or storeroom, dining room. Would, and the dining room could, could seat about nine people. And the theory is that first, in 1 Corinthians, all of the poor people would be in here and the wealthy people would be in here. They'd be separated. But in Thessalonica, sorry to pass over something cool. My goodness, it's down low. Okay, in Thessalonica, the people lived in something like this. This is a this is called tenement housing, uh, and the shops are facing the street down here. And Paul would have been working in a shop that looked kind of like this, and the rest of the people would be you know living in squalor uh, somewhere around here. So. This is a kind of situation that Thessalonians um, is uh, situated in. And up here, show you, uh, these are pictures of inside one of these houses. Now this is up near the top where the wealthy people were, and this would be uh, brilliant colors. This is in Ephesus, and you can kind of see right here, there's a white roof over it. To protect this and then they have a second house just to the south of this one I mean right next to it where you know a lot of people live there and it just the houses just keep going back and back it's kind of cool here are some mosaics in the same house or the same uh, complex and you can see people here these, these are mosaics too on the walls. So, anyway, cool stuff. Okay, and the situation that we see in First and Second Thessalonians is different from the situation in Acts, where uh, Jason is a patron of the church and he has um, church members meeting in his house, and uh, there's no mention of him in. First Thessalonians, so either he's gone or he was a fabrication. And after first the failure in Thessalonica, I think that Paul changed his missionary strategy and he focused on getting a patron first, you know, finding a wealthy supporter and building a church around that wealthy supporter who could protect the church from harm. And uh, some persecution could be rooted in uh, being kicked out of the family. You know, your family in the ancient world uh, was your source of everything. And the, everybody worshipped the same God in a family and or followed the religion of the, of the head of the family, which is the pater familias, the oldest male would decide the religion of everyone. And if a person becomes a Christian, they can be ostracized from their family. And we know that this happened uh, in later Christianity, you know, just 40 years later. So it could very possibly have happened in Thessalonica, where they're persecuted because they don't have any family to protect them. Because it was obviously as a great offense to the family if you uh, rejected the household gods 
and followed after some foreign religion. You know, they could probably tolerate you following a different Roman religion, but it's even worse when you follow an unknown uh, new religion that has just come into town and, and Paul's caused, Paul has caused all kinds of grief uh, with, his, with his caustic preaching. And there's a separation uh, from patrons and friends. You know, this is another, another issue. The client would have to follow the religion of the patron, or at least act like it, and not offend the patron with religious rhetoric and, and uh, rebellion. So if uh, the uh, Christian believer offended the patron, well, they're exposed to the elements. Okay, theology of Thessalonians. Uh, Paul had this idea uh, in Thessalonians that the coming back of Jesus, the parousia, would be immediate. And it would end the suffering of the Thessalonians, defeat their enemy. And it's in each chapter. So Paul changes his mind later, you know, where the parousia is active now, but it's going to come later. There's an idea of election, and um, Calvinists love this part, you know, that you're chosen by God for, God for God's purpose. This is important when you're going through persecution. You know, Paul comforts them by letting them know that God has a purpose. You know, God chose the Thessalonians for a very specific plan, and God is going to reward them. Another thing I really like about Thessalonians is the themes of faith, hope, and love. And I didn't notice how important this was until I took a class on 1 Corinthians in my PhD program, and the uh, instructor was Victor Paul Furnish, who had just finished a, I don't know how many years of study on 1 Thessalonians, and wrote a commentary on, on it. Uh, and in the commentary, and in his lectures, faith, hope, and love are very important. And as you know, in 1 Corinthians, uh, faith, hope, and love are important. And it can, this really connects um, 1 Thessalonians with later Pauline writings. And also, the teaching of uh, the resurrection of the dead. Uh, some have died in, in uh, 2 Thessalonians. Uh, some have died, and Paul wants to comfort them, and reinforces his uh, theology of the resurrection of the dead. Paul's concept of justification in the theology of, of uh, Thessalonians is underdeveloped, which means that he hasn't really worked out how people are justified through Jesus Christ, you know, justification by faith, and how it starts with Abraham, and so on and so forth. We'll cover that in Romans. In Galatians, it's his second earliest. Uh, we don't really know what Galatians means uh, as far as a geographical location. There is a theory that Paul is writing it to South Galatians, which is the most popular, and almost nobody believes that he's writing it to Northern Galatia. Uh, that's just something that you need to know. I mean, people talk about this a lot. First thing scholars do when they're writing a commentary on Galatians is argue that it's written to people in South Galatia. There's a problem of eating together, and this speaks to the separation of Christians and Jews in early Christianity. And basically, Jews have to give up everything. They have the dietary laws, you know, the, the uh, laws of cleanliness, which is basically what this is uh, centered around. And in, in order to eat with Gentiles, they have to forego their dietary restrictions. You know, the idea that they'd be unclean if they ate the Gentiles. The Gentiles, on the other hand, didn't follow 
dietary laws, or maybe they follow part of the dietary laws of the Jews, but they just had to sit down and eat. I mean, they didn't have to give up anything. There was no compromise. So what Paul tries to do is give Jews a theology of justification that will theologically allow them to forego these restrictions and have fellowship with the Gentiles, the Gentile believers. And the argument has been, as we know, that Christianity is a natural flow from Judaism. You know, that uh, you have Judaism is from God, from, uh, you know, from Abraham to Jesus, and then Judaism naturally becomes Christianity. And that's what Paul was trying to do. You know, he's trying to unify uh, Jews and Gentiles and get them not only theo theologically together, and, you know, justified by the same kind of faith, but also, uh, you know, just eat together. And the eating together, the refusal to eat together, um, is a concrete sign that the, that there's theological disunity. You know, it offends his theology, in other words, that they don't eat together. Now, Peter comes down. In uh, Galatians 2, Paul talks about uh, Peter coming from Jerusalem, and he eats separately with the Jews. And Paul is furious and corrects Peter. Now, this is more than just a historical event. This is an event where Paul is exercising authority over the leader of the church. So, at least in the letter, he's doing that. You know, and Paul even says it boldly. You know, I, I went right to his face and told him that he's being a hypocrite. And Peter acquiesces, and they try to bring the Gentiles and the, and the Jews together. And we know that didn't work. Now, I've kind of hinted on this. There's a question of Paul's authorship, Paul's apostleship. So, he devotes a lot of the letter to establishing himself as an apostle. One of the ways he establishes himself is, re is reminding the Galatians about this encounter with Peter. He also talks about having an encounter with, with James and John in Jerusalem, where he learns from the pillars of the faith, but he insists that he got his gospel directly from Jesus. And I think that uh, that about does it. Um, we also have the theme of God and family and relationship between law and promise, which is kind of, uh, we kind of touched about that on justification by faith. Galatians has a more developed idea of justification by faith, and Paul perfects it in Romans. So, uh, that is that. I'm uh, very, very happy with how the midterms turned out. I hope you are too. Um, I do appreciate feedback. Uh, if you ever want to give me feedback, either by email or by um, the, the feedback thread in Blackboard, and I am available to you if you have any questions. Hey everybody, uh, I didn't have time to make more than one take uh, yesterday when I did my lecture and I noticed that um, I might have been a little bit uh, indirect or confusing when I was explaining friendship and patronage and also uh, what frank speech is. Um, these concepts are, are tightly wound together because friendship is a social relationship between equals and patronage is an economic relationship between a uh, higher up and somebody that's lower in the social strata. So uh, it's, it's a pretty big difference, but patrons wanted to express themselves uh, using traditional friendship language and family language when they were talking about people that were beneath them.
you know, it, it was, even though it was very important for Romans to be um, aware of their rank, you know, it, rank was just a, a very important part of the lives. Um, even though uh, that's true, they didn't want, it, it was considered uh, impolite to express that dominance um, in rough language. And so that's at least the ideal, you know. What would happen is every morning, you know, this is a wealthy person's house, a, a diagram, and here's the street right here in the door. And every morning, his clients would, would show up uh, pretty early in the morning. They would line up around the outside of the house here on the street. And the patron or patroness would be waiting about right here, sitting on a chair. And the um, clients would come in one at a time and praise the patron or give the patron some goods or... Um, you know, do whatever the patron wanted them to do, and the patron would give them money or legal protection or, um, you know, any any number of things. Even it could even be as large as a house, or um, it, and it also goes all the way up. Like the the Caesar was a patron to the entire Roman Empire, but his clients were just the wealthiest people in Rome, uh, in the empire, and he would do favors for them, and they would do favors for him. It's kind of like the godfather. But there, but even though they might call each other friends, um, they're really not, because they're not equals, which was the definition of friendship. So, in ancient times, we there is an idea of friendship. It goes back to Aristotle, that friends are equals, and friends share everything with each other, and they love each other. Um, they're there for each other uh, through thick and thin. And a fair weather friend or a parasite is somebody that uh, is your friend only to get something. Um, see, a lot of that stuff sounds familiar to you, but that's how the patrons, even though they're higher, talked about their underlings. So. How is that relevant to Paul? Well, for one thing, for in friendship, that was the only context where corrective language was accepted. Because the, you know that your friend wants the best for you, so even though it may feel like an insult or hurt your feelings whenever they try to correct you, uh, it's done. In, you know that it's done in goodwill. But Paul, on the other hand, used frank speech, which is the corrective speech. He used it outside of the context of friendship within Thessalonica. And, and the primary offense was he came on far too strong uh, regarding worshiping idols. You know, he, he marched into Thessalonica and preached a message that was very uh, caustic and rough and corrective while he did not make friends with the powers that be. So the only converts that Paul got were either poor or they were kicked out of their families. If they were a member of a household like this, they could get uh, thrown out because they follow a religion that is new and foreign and offensive. You know, if Paul is... Paul is a really coming down on idol worship, his followers probably are too, and that's going to irritate the uh, head of the household and the harmony of the household. So his frank speech, it's uh, parousia, uh, it's actually a technical term, you know, frank speech, and he uses it, he uses that term in uh, First, Thessalonians, First Thessalonians. So, friendship is a relationship between equals, and patronage is a relationship between uh, someone of a higher status and someone of a lower status. And the theory is, whenever the lower status person provides a good or a service that is superior 
to the patron, their their social rank evens out. It evens out so they can practice friendship together. So, and on the other hand, whenever the patron uh, produces generosity and love toward the uh, toward the client, he's gr the patient the patron. Um, graciously comes down from his status in, in theory and they're able to address each other as equals and friends and this relationship is very tenuous because the patron could call it off at any time and um, leave the client um, out you know high and dry and there were laws that governed uh, relationships between patrons and clients, but I'm not going to get into that because the Roman law didn't matter that much uh, when it comes down to regular practice. You know, what are you going to do if you're a client and, you know, your patron decides that he's going to rip you off and uh, you can't, you don't have the money to go get a lawyer and prosecute him in court. And if you tried, uh, the patron has the resources to kill you. So it's a, uh, it's a very brutal and uh, merciless uh, setup that is coded with uh, friendship language. And Paul navigates through that system and uses it to his advantage in Corinth and Galatia and Rome. But uh, it blew up in his face in Thessalonica. Hope that's clear. If you have any questions, uh, let me know.